time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Willie Lay, renowned scientist and author of rockets, missiles, and space travel. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. But first, some context. The 1952 Washington, D.C. UFO flap was a series of sightings of unidentified flying objects over Washington, D.C. that ran from the 12th to the 29th of July, 1952. The most dramatic events took place on the two consecutive weekends of the 19th and the 26th. These were not only ground and aerial visual sightings, there were radar reports. Links to videos detailing events in the summer of 1952 are provided in the description. Here's a portion of what Major General John Sanford, Director of Air Force Intelligence, had to say in his July 29, 1952 press conference. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. With this July 1952 briefing on current events, the stage is now set for Willie Lay. Well, Dr. Lay, we're very happy to have you at the Chronoscope this evening, and we're hoping you can help us throw some light on this great mystery of the so-called flying saucers that so many people claim to be seeing. Now first, do you really believe there are such things as flying saucers, and what are they? Well, I believe that people are seeing something. Just what it is, is a different question. I have been following the reports on flying saucers quite carefully, ever since they first came out about five years ago. And my personal breakdown, which may differ from those of other people, is that about 85% of all the reports are simple mistakes of things which would be known to experts if they happen to see them. You mean mistaken interpretation? Mistaken interpretation. Yes. And that only about 15% are, or let's say, mysterious. Well, it's well, that 15%, of course, that we're terrifically interested in. That is the 15% we have to worry about, yes. Now, that's the 15% that, uh, do you have an explanation for that 15%? Uh, unfortunately, not only one. <laughs> uh, people have advanced four different explanations for the, this 15 percent. The other 85 percent are mistaken sightings of meteorological balloons, skyhook balloons, etc., etc. Uh, the four explanations advanced were, number one, which was the most pleasing to believe, that they were secret experiments of our armed forces. Uh, this explanation has to be considered obsolete because the armed forces, A, have repeatedly declared that they are not of their making, the flying saucers, 
and B, it would be highly unlikely that one branch of the government spends money, time, effort and machinery on investigating something done by another branch of the government. The second explanation advanced by some were that they were secret experiments of the Russians. This is unlikely. I can't tell you without looking it up how many square miles there are in the United States. But I do know that the Russians have three times as many square miles in which to make secret experiments. You mean they would have their own flying saucers all over their they own territory? They would have them over their own territory. Well, how about their being uh, equipped with photographic instruments or something of that sort? Well, most reports insist that the flying saucers are quite high. And what you could see from the attitudes at which they are supposed to fly isn't worth reporting. Well, now, you eliminate now two things. Number yeah. one, you're convinced that they're not caused by something our own government's doing. Number yeah. one, you're convinced that they're not Russian. Right. Now, number three, what uh, could Number they be? three is a widely publicized belief that they are of interplanetary origin. Well, I notice a good many, uh, or several, uh, rather reputable people think that they may be of interplanetary origin. What do you think of that, sir? Well, I am not principally opposed to an alien spaceship landing tomorrow and teaching us a lot of things which we can't do ourselves yet, but I don't think the flying saucers are it. Uh, by this remark, I mean, I do not rule out that there are alien spaceships flying around somewhere, but I don't think they have visited us yet. Well, now, what, what's your thinking along that line? Well, Why do you think that they cannot be uh, interplanetary spaceships? For, in <coughs> the first place, the fact which is often stressed that they are completely noiseless. No matter how advanced somebody else's engineering might be, it is impossible to shove a massive structure at high speed through the atmosphere without making some noise. Uh, a very simple example, the well-known noise of artillery projectors when they move. They have no motor in them that makes noise. It's their movement through the air that does. So this noiselessness is one that would... No, uh, fast travel through the air that's noiseless is, is, is scientifically impossible. Something which I can't <coughs> see, that's right. Secondly, most of the estimates of the flying saucers, the size estimates, run to about 100 feet in diameter. This is far too small for anything to make such a long trip as the distance between planets. Uh, at this moment, Mars is still in the sky, invisible, and is 80 million miles away. And for anything that has to make a trip of 80 million miles, I I, I wouldn't be satisfied with a diameter of 100 feet. Well, then you think these are natural phenomena? That is the fourth explanation stuff. which is left, that of a natural phenomenon. Now, I'd like to stress one point here. Flying saucers are not new. If you have the necessary time and patience to read through all old files of magazines, especially meteorological magazines, you will find reports in them which by now would be labeled flying saucers. They weren't labeled flying saucers, is that? No, I no. Mean, they flying saucers is just a new name for something that's been seen for a long time. Which so has on and off at long intervals been seen for a long time. So this ties in with the idea that it might be a natural phenomenon uh, which either escaped attention in the past because fewer people looked into the sky or else which actually was rarer. Uh, for example, a hurricane is a natural phenomenon, well known to everybody, but you don't have a certain num set number of hurricanes per year. It differs. Well, well briefly, what are the uh, other uh, explainable errors, the misinterpretations? You say this accounts for about 85% of the... Uh, oh, the, the meteorites, mis I think. misinterpretations. Yes. Well, the main culprit in that respect are, of course, the so-called skyhook balloons, large plastic balloons about a hundred feet tall, which carry instrumentation, 70 pounds of it. As a matter of fact, the people who operate the skyhook balloons in several cases have been able to trace lost balloons by searching the newspapers for flying saucer reports. Now, these skyhook balloons are operated by our own government. By agent, the Navy. By the Navy. Yes. And they are sent up to what uh, altitude? Uh, generally to about a hundred thousand feet. Sometimes they go a little bit higher. Around 100,000 feet, and occasionally one of them gets loose, and it's... It, yes. It, it, it very very often it gets forward. loose on purpose. Uh, the instruments are connected with a parachute, 
to the balloon. And this connection then is broken so that the instruments drift to the ground by parachute and the empty, empty balloon is permitted to drift off because it couldn't be reused anyway. Well now, is our mm. own government, our own defense department taking the uh, balloon reports, I mean the flying saucer reports, seriously? They have to. After all, the Air Force, which is the one which is investigating, is charged with the defense of our skies. So if there is anything in the skies which they don't know and cannot account for, it makes them understandably uneasy. And well, what percentage of these reports do they think are hoaxes or are the reports of people who just want publicity or something of that sort? The feeling seems to be that this isn't, this was the case several years ago, but not anymore. Uh, because right now, if you report having seen a flying saucer, you open yourself up to ridicule too, which is something which is deplored by the Air Force because they want as many reports as possible in order to draw a conclusion. Uh, in other words, members of our audience who might, for one reason or another, see a flying saucer can make the reports to the Air Force and be rendering a service now yes. and not invite ridicule. Yeah, they certainly would. As a matter of fact, now this is not I am not absolutely sure about that, but I think their names are kept secret if requested. Yes. Well, what about the chances of building our own flying saucers, building our own spaceships? Uh, yes, but they wouldn't be flying saucers. <laughs> <laughs> they would have the well-known rocket shape, which is known to everybody in the audience from countless newsreels showing we to take offs and similar things. Uh, the problem of space travel to take the whole complex, has progressed by now to a point where there is only one large problem left, and that is financing. Well, when you say space travel is solved, to what extent is it solved? What has been solved? Well, we know how, it, let's, let's start, let's start at the tail end of the, of the spaceship, which is the rocket motor. We now know how to build a well-functioning rocket motor of almost any size that should be needed. We have well-functioning methods for steering a rocket when it is in flight. Uh, we know what fuels are best suited for specific uses. Uh, now, moving farther up, we know what the cabin of a spaceship should look like and what the medical problems involved are. And we have, for unmanned rockets, all the instrumentation which will be required. Well, now, you say that only money is required, Doctor. In your lifetime, do you expect to see uh, some space travel? Yes, I hope so. As a matter of fact, I am practically certain. And you, th you think that, uh, as a citizen and a scientist, do you think that there should be some uh, organized effort in our own country to promote yes. this type of study and this type of scientific yes, investigation? Yes, I do so. It would be very useful not only from a cultural point of view, for scientific reasons, but it also has military value. The military value is what gives it urgency. So you think that uh, we, it might be well if we had a national academy or something of that sort that was actually studying this The thing. best would be to set up a special agency, similar, say, to the Atomic Energy Commission, to do the actual work. Well, well, Doctor, I'm sure that our audience has very much appreciated your views tonight, and thank you thank for being you. with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Willie Lay, renowned scientist and author of Rockets, Missiles, and Space Travel. Consistently superior manufacture alone has made Longines the world's most honored watch. Never in 86 years of business has Longines deviated from its avowed policy of making the finest watch possible by precision production methods. Thus, at world's fairs and international expositions, in competition with the products of the world's finest watchmakers, Longines watches have consistently won highest honors including 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards. And in the competitive accuracy trials at the great government observatories, Longines watches have won innumerable prizes, bulletins, and awards of merit. In view of the demonstrated superiority of Longines watches, it is remarkable 
that Lorne Jean watches can be produced for as little as $71.50, less in fact than the price of many watches of little distinction. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, remember, when you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longine. Why not insist on getting a Longine, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. For thrills, see suspense on the CBS television network.